Good, uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm Tracy Miranda from Teacher Coders. I wish I had a, a white lab coat like Jay, but I don't. <laughs> um, so I'll be talking to you today about uh, integrating Java and Python, which is sort of an ongoing initiative um, in the science working group. And I first spoke about this at EclipseCon France. Was anyone there for this talk? Oh, good. It'll be all fresh for everyone. Um, but this is really, well, since then, it, it's really evolved, and it's kind of a continuous story of integration and collaboration within the science working group. So we'll start with, well, why Python? So Python's always been a really, really popular language. And um, like if you look at the, the rankings of languages, so number one and two tend to be the same. Uh, Tide, do you know what the most popular language is? Anyone? Yeah? Java. Java, tied with? With uh, JavaScript. Yeah, well, if you look at the rankings based on sort of GitHub and uh, Stack Overflow, so JavaScript and Java are one and two. Three is, any guesses? PHP. And fourth is, is Python. <laughs> so the interesting thing is that if you look at the general language rankings, Python is, is pretty steadily held its place. Um, but if I look from my perspective as a consultant and working a lot more in kind of the scientific field, we're just seeing a continuous uptake of Python and particularly what I see as for non-traditional programmers. So scientists, um, people who are in very specialized technical fields are really adopting Python. And the reason is is it's, it's super easy to use, it's super accessible, and with NumPy and SciPy, it's super powerful. So that's always been true about Python, but what we're seeing now is that you've got things like IPython Notebook, which suddenly takes it into this whole new collaborative area. Has anyone used IPython Notebook? Yeah, anyone a fan? I see a few nods. And uh, it's just got a tremendous community behind it, like in the UK, just this year, there have been three major PyCon events, well, there's PyCon, PyData, EuroSciPy. So we're just seeing tremendous growth um, in Python and especially for bringing in people who didn't traditionally program and it's, it's a great way for them to get into um, just doing things more powerfully. So, well, here at Eclipse, we've, we've got our own great community, but we're in the Java land and then you've got Python. So the in some ways they're quite different. So <laughs> Java is statically typed, Python dynamically typed. Java, as we know, is quite verbose and Python tends to be quite concise. And while Python is ideal for beginners, you usually run into trouble when you're starting to scale. And that's why you know, Java will tend to be used by big enterprise companies to be, you know, like us at Eclipse, where we build big frameworks. Where on the other hand, Python is just loved by the academics and the researchers, people who are playing around with data. They don't know exactly what they're looking for, but they really just want to manipulate it and toss things around and see what happens. So the, the question is, how do you, each, each of these has their own sweet spot, and how do you make sure that people can use the right tool for the right job? You know, don't start trying to use Python for building big infrastructures, and don't use Java for playing around with a bit of data, but have an environment where they can both sit um, side by side, even though they're they quite different beasts, they, they can live together in harmony. And the whole idea of this talk is to say, well, how can we get that really tight integration and do it uh, so that they're both sort of first class citizens in an environment? So very specifically, I'm gonna look at a case study on some work um, Jonah and myself have been doing for, well, about three, three or four years ago, we started it off. And that's at Light Diamond Light Source, which is a synchrotron in the UK countryside. So you can think of it as a really, really powerful, um, ooh, what's, a really powerful, mag like sort of magnifying, so you can look at really tiny um, particles. And they, they study everything there from, I don't know, things like chocolate to dinosaur bones to just more boring things like drugs and things like that. <laughs> But yes, it's really tremendous research that happens there. And the scale of the data that they're dealing with is, is pretty good. So I stole this quote from a presentation from Mark Basham where he said, there's a principal beamline scientist who in 2005 said, 
I have all the data I have ever collected on a floppy disk and process it by hand. Now, in 2014, that same scientist, in a four-month period, had collected one terabyte of data. And the rates are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So they're having to deal with all this data and, and make sense of it. And for that, um, you need you know, substantial tools that are up to the job. So um, that's where Dawn Science comes in. And Dawn Science is the Eclipse RCP-based uh, tool from Diamond, which is used by the scientists and all the people who come into the facility to just look at their data in, in different ways. So, so one of the requirements of putting in Python, um, all what Dawn is looking to do is replace all these separate toolkits. A lot of them are, tend to be Python, but give an environment to the scientists where this st is still quite familiar and it's quite a big job of kind of easing them into the process of saying use Eclipse and use it even though you're familiar with Python. So you have to kind of create something that it's familiar to them. Okay, so these were the requirements. Um, top one was just controlling the user interface from Python. And then the next level was the sort of Python to Java where in Python you're able to access the Java objects and you'd use this for moving data around plotting arrays in the workbench, and you still want to be able to run your existing scripts. So there was a firm requirement that you had to be able to run scripts that included things like NumPy and SciPy. And then the other way around, um, in Java, can your code access scripts in Python? And the main use case for that was uh, like a workflow flow where you might extend the user interface with a little bit of Python, um, maybe to do a, an algorithm or to implement something in the language that the scientists were comfortable with. Okay, so I'll kind of go through the steps we, we went to to create that environment. And the very first step was saying, well, we're in Eclipse land and there's this great set of tools called PyDev. Has anyone used PyDev? Yeah, it's a really good um, Python development environment based on Eclipse. And it supports all the different implementations of Python. So if you think of Python itself as the language specification, you've got CPython and Jython, which is the Java integration, PyPy, IonPython, and then also the additional technologies like Cython and IPython. And uh, yeah, PyDev is really, really good. It's got a rich set of functionality. And uh, one of the big things is, is the debugger. So debug is really hard, but PyDev has um, a really powerful back end. You can even kind of visually look at data. So if you have a data array that doesn't make sense to you as numbers, you can right click on that and say plot and, and look at it visually. And in fact, the, the PyDev uh, back end debugger is, is actually what powers things like PyCharm. I don't know if anyone uses PyCharm, but that's really just the PyDev debugger under the hood. So, um, also PyDev has some really nice features like um, integrating different interactive backends. And actually, I'll show you this. This is quite good. But what you can do is. If you use the IPython magic function PyLab to set up a different interactive backend, and I plot, okay, so that pulls in the namespaces from matplotlib and numpy, and then I just come up with 10,000 random data points, and then I call the matplotlib function histogram. So what that does is it pulls that into matplotlib. And one of the nice things about that is that stays interactive and the console stays interactive as well. And you can't even do that with just a Python console because normally you, you have the console locked out. But now you've got users can sort of switch between them. And that worked really well just to kind of get the scientists out of their comfort zone saying, hey, you can use matplotlib with it. You probably don't want to because we've got better tooling, but at least it kind of gets them into that Okay, so okay, so you start off with PyDev, you get the console, and you get all the tooling there. 
So the next aspect is how do I control the user interface? And um, the simple thing to do is to just use Jython. So Jython is the Java implementation of Python, and it runs in the JVM, so it can access all of the Java classes. And, and Jython will take you quite far in terms of being able to script things um, using Python. But um, so a couple of problems um, that Diamond saw that they weren't too happy with is first of all, in Jython, you can't access any of the C modules. It doesn't give you access to C extension libraries. And you really need that if you're going to have NumPy and SciPy. So there's a project called Jini, which could solve this, but progress on it is pretty slow, and there's no Windows support, and you know it's only sort of got initial NumPy support. So it's kind of a, we weren't really going to hold our breath and wait for that. And then another problem is um, something from the usability point of view that in PyDev, um, the users has to have to sort of pick, are you going to be in Jython or are you going to be in Python? And for a lot of the users, the, the question, you know, they don't really understand the implementation. They just have a script and they want it to work. And they don't necessarily know, am I using a library that's implemented in C? Am I not? So having to have them think about that and do that is an ideal. You want to, to say, if it's Python, you know, you can run it, and if, if it has extension libraries, it will just work. So we're looking to just get rid of these sort of separate environments. Okay, so that led us to looking at a technology called Py4j. And Py4j is dubbed as a, a bridge between Java and Python. So it runs in the JVM and allows Python to access all the Java classes. And so using this, it really gave us control of the user interface and just the ability to, to script the user interface and at the same time have that CPython support. And I'll show you this as part of, of the demos later. But I'll just say on the downside um, with Py4j is that it would create proxies rather than moving data about. And proxies are fine for, for little bits of data, but when you're talking about bigger arrays, then that's not a good solution. And the other thing, Py4j takes a blanket approach to exposing everything in Java. And you don't necessarily want that for your users. You might want to just curate them to focus them on a few APIs and just give them something really nice to use. And then there's sort of limited Java to Python support as well. So, um, okay, just before we move on from Py4j, one of the really nice things that Py4j did allow us to do was um, interactive auto-completion of Java code in Python. And I'll show you that in the demo in a minute. But you can also have pop-up help um, just based on method signatures. So use this reflection to look at your Java code and, and it can give you all, all help as well, which is a, a really nice feature for working in Python but accessing your Java code. Okay, so the last piece of the puzzle um, to put it together was um, we ended up doing a custom solution called Analysis RPC. And the basic idea was that this would be the technology um, that would move the data around. So RPC, meaning remote procedure calls, and actually it's the transport underneath is XML RPC. But it's enhanced in that it understands um, the data sets. It understands what an ND array is and it understands things like regions of interest and exceptions. So you can have an, a Python exception and you, you can understand that in Java and vice versa. And so this was implemented, um, the framework is language independent, but it was very specifically implemented as something for Java and Python. Um, okay, rather than go into, I'll get back into internals of that, but let's just look at some examples of what it all looks like when you kind of put all that technology together. So, okay, I've got my cheat sheet up here. So, um, Okay, first of all, um, when the user, if I just, let's just clear that. A user in, in Diamond will typically, well, they'll have this import, it will run automatically for them. 
but DNP refers to diamond numpy and that's the entry point that they provided for the users to access all their plotting system. So once the users have the handle on DNP then they can run through some um, sort of key bits of functionality. So let's say you do DNP random rand which is saying can I have 100 by 100 data points so you've got your data there I could do a print data and you see you've, you've just got your data there if we have a look at um, the shape you'll see it's 100 by 100 then from there you could take that and you could plot it so you plot that and you get a 2D plot and to get hold of the plotting system, you'd call this API dmp.plot.getplottingsystem, and that gives you a handle on Diamond's plotting system. So if we look at the type of that, that's a Java object. So plotting system is something that exists in the Java code. And I can show you, now you can do the command completion. So all these are Java methods, so you can find your getters and you can find your setters. In this case, we'll get hold of a trace Oops, and assign that. So I'm using this nice feature in PyDev where if you just press F2 on, on my cheat sheet here, it pastes it into the console. Okay, so once you have the trace, again, you could say, what can I do with the trace? I could get the area alpha, I could get circle colors, or you might want to set things like the axis name. So you can play, people can then start playing around with the API to see what, what can you do. In this case, we'll set the palette data. So for those of you who like your color maps, you could set it to NCD, set it to grayscale, or just pick the different color schemes. And one of the reasons this was really nice for the scientists is that when they were sending someone their data, they would send them a little script so that people could visualize the data in exactly the same way they were seeing it. So they'd set up the color map, the scales, the axes, all using a little script so that if two people were working remotely, they could look at the data in, in exactly the same way. Okay. Um, so we'll just clear that out. And again, there's plotting APIs to manage the windows as well. So we've got this kind of pl plot window manager and you can just open up different plots. Okay, that one is already open. Okay, we'll try doing something else just to show you the round trips between Java and Python and Python to Java. So let's say we create, um, okay, I'll show you a 2D plot as well. You can just do kind of line plots and you can do image plots. And again, all of that, you can just control it from the command line. Now, if we were to do, let's say something with real data, one of the nice features of the integration was that you could take um, a file, so Dawn use um, HDF in an Nexus format, and that holds all, <coughs> all the user's data. So you might take that and find your data in there. Um, I'm looking for that. Give me a Sorry, just double checking. OK, so let's say I've got a bit of data in an HDF file. And if I drag that to the console, it will automatically put in the API to load that up for you. So it knows that it can use this dnp.io.load. So when you do that in the drag and drop, um, it automatically finds the location to the file, and it finds the entry that you selected. So you've, again, you've got really nice integration for the user. Okay, then we'll assign that to the data. Now, as a matter of course, if you're doing things in PyDev and you have debug on, um, you'll be able to, you, you can see the debug session is, is running in the background. So, one of the things is you could go to the variables view and you could see your data there as well. 
And again, we could do things, if we wanted to, we could plot it from there. So we could say plot the data and oh, let's see if that's going to plot. plot that as an image. No, OK, not sure why that's not doing it, but OK, I think I may have grabbed the wrong piece of data. I'm just going to start that again. OK, so just plotted that manually. But again, as well, if you should be able to work from there if I had the right bit of data from the HDF file. OK, so. Now we've got our data, and one of the things the user might do is interact with that data or focus on the specific data of interest, which is down here. So they might draw a bit of a profile around that, and they could zoom in and sort of say, well, actually, this is the thing I really care about, so I want my data to just um, Look at that. So they can specify a region of interest just around the data they want. And so the nice thing is now that in Java, you've specified that region of interest, but then you can get a handle on that into Python. So if I use this API, dmp.plot.get ROI, which is get the region of interest, then I can have the ROI is now in into the Python world. So I've got that rectangle with, with all the parameters. And then a scientist can take that, do some calculations on it. This is a bit random. I'm just extracting some, some data from it. I could imagine they, they'd apply an algorithm they'd written in Python. And then they could pull that back into Eclipse and plot that in a separate window, maybe with some transformations. And so now that you've got the full round trip of data going in Java, into Python, back out to Java, just, just when you need it. So, yeah, so that's, that's the idea of the power of what you can do with it and how you can connect everything up. And uh, just to kind of quickly go over what, what's happening. So if, if you're in the Python world and you've got your um, arrays, so you say your X and your Y, and then you're plotting that to Java, it goes through a process of what we call flattening where it just then goes over the transport. And this is the, the analysis RPC bit. The metadata is, goes over XML RPC, because that's cheap. And then the data sets themselves get copied using disk and memory. And then on the other side, it's, it's unflattened or unmarshaled into Java. And likewise, for the reverse case, you, you have, again, the, the data set going over memory and the metadata going over um, XML RPC to kind of get that bi-directional um, passing of data. Okay, and the other side you can do um, Python to Java and this is used in, in the workflows and I believe the Triquetrium project um, also using analysis RPC to have little Python actors so you can have a workflow where one of the actors is written in Python and implemented so that will use the Python to Java to, to actually hook that up together. So analysis RPC allows you to move data around efficiently. You can do Java to Python, Python to Java. It handles exceptions. But part of the problem is that it's only available in Dawn site today. I mean, some versions have been forked, like into Triquetrium. But it's generally not available very light, widely, and it, it's hard to extend it or, or to use it in different ways. So that was kind of the, the problem we're seeing um, coming into the science working group. And it was great that we could put all this together, but what wasn't so good is that you have all these disparate pieces, and it's really hard to kind of reproduce that and use that nicely. So we're sort of asking ourselves, so this was back at EclipseCon France. How can we unify all this technology and make it kind of work together and work for everybody in the same way? And uh, that's when we started hearing much more about um, Ease and the Eclipse advanced scripting environment. 
And this is a scripting environment which is, is pretty powerful and you can extend the workbench, you can control the UE. So we thought, this is great. But the only problem was that it, it only supports languages that exist in the JVM, so JavaScript and Jython. So we're like, well, can we use this um, for a non-JVM based language and what are the challenges we'd face doing that? Um, <coughs> So one of the big issues we quickly sort of run into is, is just the threading. And you've, if you've got a separate Java and separate Python, let's say in Java you have a button and you click on that button and that calls into some Python code, but the Python code wants to update the UI. So it wants access back to the UI code, but that, the UI is locked on Python. So it's some interesting sort of threading models uh, to sort out. And we're, we're kind of 90% sure that it could be done. And uh, since then, Jonas put together some prototypes. And he's, he's changed some of the threading model in Py4j. So now we know that um, you can actually interleave the calls and do that. So it is something that we know we can do. And so we can have a Py4j-based uh, Python interpreter into ease. So the plan at the moment is that we can unite Python in Eclipse. So the idea is to integrate Py4j into Ease, so have a Python interpreter extension for Ease and sort through all the, the threading and the memory management. And then integrate analysis RPC into Ease, so then you can have that for moving around the data and doing um, the bidirectional support. And then once that's available, then someone can just take Ease and now with the Py4j and analysis RPC and integrate that into their science projects or as we're seeing, even projects beyond science want to do this. There's a lot of definition to be done on the scope and you know how, how do we say what things need to be passed by value and passed by reference? How do we make it more usable? So we've, we've sort of scoped out a project where the first part of that is that we're going to integrate Py4j into Ease and we're going to have a yeah, so Py4j Python script engine and part of the user experience will be how can we use the best parts of PyDev as well. And maybe even consider, well, should Ease be part of the Eclipse platform? And for that, we're, we're looking to work with companies who can see that vision of, of where it needs to be. And really happy to say that Oak Ridge National Labs are kind of going with us and supporting this first phase of, of just getting in that interpreter. And uh, so that's something that will be happening um, in, in the new year. So. It's really kind of ongoing effort, so yeah, we're really excited about doing this. And uh, yeah, so to keep up to date with it, just join in at the Science Working Group Forum. But it really is the vision that with the tight integration of Java and Python, we can create a really powerful environment uh, for science and beyond. And uh, yeah, any questions just for me? Joanna won't be answering. So about the easy integration. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this, so it's getting this Py4j script engine in, and the work for that will, um, the time frame is Q1 next year, so that, that's the plan, subject to kind of all, all the pieces falling into place. So you, and you think at the middle of next year you will have something? Yeah, will yeah. So we've got prototypes um, where you can do hello world w with this, and... Um, I could show that if we have time, but, but, okay, yeah. So um, I'll I'll bring it up, or maybe just in the in the break. But we we know we can do it. So we've got some simple things, but we need to just um, there's a lot to kind of just flesh out and do. So at the core, it's really doable. So it's just what level are we going to have by next year? And uh, ideally, the big problem, to be honest, is just how do you sort out all the dependencies between the plugins. Sure. So but from my perspective, yeah. I'm more interested in uh, long term support for something like this. Yeah. Uh, it should not be uh, uh, something like a regular project where the code gets submitted, committed and then it dies and you have to maintain it yourself. So uh, I'm, I'm more looking for, for the, the long term perspective. Yeah. So the integration will be there with ease. I think the 
effectively the science working group will will kind of be the backers of it because I think Python is is pretty fundamental to to science. So um, it's it's in the group's interest to to just keep that going because you you, you just well there's very little science you can do without without Python. So I think long term, you know, as, as long as the science working group is there, I think it, it will definitely be supported and available. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>